Hey, David. Hey, Ben. Nice background. <laughs> Uh, we uh, we cater for our friends. Um, so David is uh, the CEO and one of the co-founders of uh, Zender. Uh, it's a company we've been uh, investing in 2018 at the time together with our friends at Holzbring Ventures. Um, and since then, uh, I think a, a lot has happened uh, already. Uh, just a few things to mention. I, I believe there was uh, accumulation of a hundred million dollars fundraising across two rounds where you added Excel uh, and also Lakestar to your supporter base. Uh, you ended a joint venture with Post Italiane in Italy. Uh, there was multiple geographic expansions. Uh, there was an um, acquisition or let's say um, combination with Everroad. And then finally, the um, probably the big bang at, towards the end of this year, uh, the acquisition of the um, European business over freight. So a very uh, exciting time that I enjoyed a lot the ride uh, together with you and the team. And um, I think maybe just before we jump into this and the journey, maybe just a quick explanation from you what you're doing so that everybody on the line uh, understands and then what the benefits for the customers are. Sure. So Senna is a digital freight forwarder with a very specific focus, which is full truck loads or FTL. Uh, our business model is very simple. It's comparable to that of Uber Freight or Convoy in the US. Um, uh, and on, the, on one side of our business model, we have large shippers. They're called Amazon, Coca-Cola, Unilever. Shippers have to move freight from point A to point B and need a dedicated truck that move only their load. And also there's a definition of full truck load. On the other side, we have small family-owned trucking companies with five to 50 trucks, no digital processes whatsoever. So what we do is we bring these, bring these two sides together the Amazons with the small trucking companies and do not only have a marketplace approach, but go a step further, which means with a contractual partner and a single point of contact to both the Coca-Colas and the small trucking companies. Repackaging the service of the small companies so that the touch and feel for Amazon is as if the truck belonged to us, but we're complete asset light and do not hire the drivers. Excellent. And how many countries are you active now? So we have offices in seven countries. Uh, we are active across uh -huh. Europe. Uh, with a fast grow, last year, September, we opened our first office outside of Berlin, our second office. And now we have seven uh, offices with 550, almost 600 people. So it was definitely a very, very exciting wow. year. That's impressive. And uh, how, I mean, one of the countries is Italy, which probably is a little bit special compared to the other countries that you're operating in, given the joint venture that you ended with Post Italiana. And I think it's not so self-explanatory what that means. So I, I guess it will be very helpful for people to understand a little bit why did you do it, uh, what is it, and how does it help your other businesses in the other countries um, to learn there? Absolutely. The, the joint venture with Poste Italiana, which is called Sender Italia, is the project I'm the proudest of. Um, why? Because we managed to convince the Italian postal operator, the equivalent of the Royal Mail in the UK or Deutsche Post in Germany, to hand us over the entire food truck load business that they have been operating for 128 years, which means that every single parcel and most or almost entire mail in Italy on the long distance from sorting hub to sorting hub is managed and run by Sender Italia, the giant venture. We This is a 100 million euro spend per year Post Italiana is saving 6% or so 6 million with respect um, to what uh, we, uh, what they spent uh, the year before. And the interesting thing, and that makes me, that excites me very much is the fact that we managed to break even on an EBITDA level after four months, over a year ahead of schedule, because we completely underestimated the impact of having so much volume and density of volume in the single geography. In Italy, we are the largest domestic freight forwarder right now in the trucking space. And this allowed us to unlock a couple of efficiencies that we did not anticipate would kick in this quickly. One is the uh, technology adoption on the trucking side. Um, in Germany and the remaining countries, we have to chase our carriers and say, please, take the load and use our technology. In Italy, now it's completely different. I even get LinkedIn messages um, asking, hey, can I work with you? What do I have to do? And now we, 
we can say, hey, you want to work with us? This is the process adopted, and that works really, really well. And the other thing we're doing really uh, well is uh, we're able to combine loads of different customers out of Pasta, with that of Amazon, with that of with the load from Coca-Cola to increase the average utilization of trucks and therefore reduce the empty kilometers, which in return means on one side, uh, fewer CO2 emissions, but uh, also um, uh, higher margins for us, which allow us to, to, to break even. And do you think that this is a, I mean, just having the volume is a big advantage, but you also need to be able to actually analyze and, you know, structure the data to, to draw the right conclusions. Do you think that's a, an, an advantage that other more traditional players would actually have? Or is this pretty unique also because you're, you, you have that, some, some specifics? Absolutely. Typically, startup first have ideas and then the technology, but what they typically lack is then the possibility to apply that technology at scale. And I always say we have to get to certain volumes or, or economics in order to make things really attractive, very profitable and so on. And in Italy specifically, we have the best of both. On one side, we have the technology we've been developing over the past few years, and now we have the volume and uh, the density to really apply that technology. So it's, uh, let's say, it, for me personally, was very uh, proved that what we're doing is right and that at scale it can really work and we managed to get to that scale improve that much earlier than we thought thanks to this joint venture Perfect. and given that this was uh, a timing where i think the first wave of corona um started to to materialize when you ramped up italy um maybe that's a good way to morph into that um obligatory discussion around corona impact how how did corona impact your ramp up in italy and your business in general would say overall had an extremely positive effect on Sender. Uh, we had opportunities that we would, without Corona, would have probably not have realized. The acquisition of Avero probably would have not happened the way it happened without Corona. Also, the acquisition of Uber Freight Europe would have not happened, not have happened without Corona. Um, the hiring of a lot of talent, especially on the tech and engineering front, would have not have happened. So we're all extremely, extremely positive. Of course, there are also a couple of challenges that we, we are facing right now. We're running two post-merge integrations in parallel, fully remote. Uh, we are scaling the giant venture, which is going into the first Christmas peak season, also fully remote. The office in Milan is, uh, is uh, let's say, closed. Um, so there's also a few challenges, but until now, um, if I look at the numbers, we somehow manage to, to, yeah, to address these challenges in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way. You mentioned that the acquisitions might not have happened. How, how, do, you, how do you mean? Why would that be? So these were acquisitions that we did not plan. So if you remember last year when we when we had our budget discussion for the for 2020, there were a lot of oh, other well. things we wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then uh, you know uh, both uh, Ever Road and Uber Freight knocked on our door and said, "Hey guys, uh, for a number of reasons, we are open to the idea of joining forces with you guys." And um, The funding environment, especially in March, April, um, the VCs in, in, in the session we probably remember was not the best. I almost had a lot of question marks, uh, which meant that joining forces with, with us uh, was an opportunity for Ever Road to secure the future. And the same aspect on the Uber Freight side, um, where Uber Freight had to decide whether they want to double down on Europe with more investments, especially into tech, where they need a different type of technology than in the US. Um, or not. And I think the fact that uh, Corona made things more uncertain uh, pushed at the end, we were afraid to say, let's join forces with number one in Europe. Um, uh, and uh, this is why I think that uh, in the two oppositions, Corona played an important role. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then Because you mentioned Uber Freight just right now, can you share a little bit about the logic of the acquisition from your perspective, but also from Uber's perspective and um, the mentioned cooperation agreement uh, that people might not you know, really know what, what it means? So for us, let's start with us. Uh, for Senda, um, there are three main reasons why we did this. Uh, first of all, uh, the business relationship that Uber Freight brought in the business. Um, uh, they uh, launched Europe with the number of customers that they were serving in the US. 
And uh, this is, was something that uh, were customers that we have been trying to acquire for a very long time. And Uber Freight had these customers only for a long time and had them in Europe, but they also had a lot of API and EDI integration with these customers, which makes a big difference in terms of automation, lock-in, and upsell opportunities. So this is something that the first opportunity, getting this business um, to sender. The second opportunity uh, or the second reason was the team. Um, uh, we grew so quickly from 100 and 80 people to 500 people within a year it means that we now have to step up our game and move from the teenage phase, uh, I call it, to the young adult phase. And uh, the senior management of Uber Freight has seen that. A lot of people came from Uber, from Amazon. We had their European GM join as CEO, helping us um, bring the organization to the level uh, it needs to be in order to make the next step. So the team was the second one. And the third one was a cooperation with Uber Freight, um, which means that on one side, we joined forces with the one player in Europe that had potentially sufficient financial resources to catch up. And on the other side, the opportunity to collaborate in developing a couple of things on the commercial and on the technology side. On the technology side today, we are already co-developing new API standards to allow uh, big shippers in North America and Europe to use the same way of communicating uh, with, with, with forwarders, with us. Um, and we're also working on developing green products, CO2 neutral or greener transport products that big shippers can um, uh, um, buy for North America and Europe uh, with, a, with, a, with a one standard approach. So I remember quite a few things that we discussed on how to you know, form the two companies together and you're now a couple of weeks in, so to speak. Um, are you getting along with, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a massive, probably massive organizational, um, structural or procedural, um, challenge. Um, how do you and the team feel about it? I mean, I do get the newsletter. I know it's going quite well, but maybe you can share a few thoughts on that. Well, we're still in the middle of it. So it still feels good, but probably next year, <laughs> should we have another session? You can ask that question again and probably have more insights until now. It looks like um, things are going in the right direction. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on the cultural integration and making sure that the team that joined did not only felt welcome, but also understands where we're going and what the role is. So we, we have a dedicated team that is just responsible for in both uh, cross-merger integrations to address the topic of people. We monitor on a weekly basis the NPS and really um, uh, focus on, on ensuring that we address uncertainty and, and the problems. Um, so this is why I have a feeling that it's going really, really well, but we're still in the middle of it. And uh, I think that next year, I probably have a, a, a more sober view on, uh, on how things uh, yeah, okay. developed. So before um, jumping to my last questions, I wanted to tackle a few of those uh, questions that have been coming in here. Um, one is more a comment than a question that I wanted to share with you. It just simply says, David, you are amazing. That's interesting. <laughs> I can share with you later on who that was. Um, then we also have uh, a few questions. One was, um, how much pressure do you feel you get by competition, uh, but the big ones like Kuno, Nagel, et cetera. So how does the relationship work there and how does it feel? So until now, um, we don't yet get the pressure because I think we just popped up on their radar. Um, just to give you an idea, Kuno, Nagel, Dimitschenko, the top five road trade forwarders in Europe have a combined market share of just over 5%. Um, so the market is highly fragmented, meaning there's a lot of opportunity for everyone. Until I think, it is my personal feeling, until maybe a couple of months ago, we have been seen as you know one of the startups that tries a lot of things, but is still very, very young and does not represent uh, a threat. Uh, I think uh, that uh, things have changed over the past few uh, months, and now we've at least seen as someone that could have an impact on the industry and on their business model potentially sometime in the future. Um, so we're taking it a little bit more seriously, um, uh, but we do not yet feel any impact simply because the market is so fragmented and um, yeah, there's not as many touch points as one might think uh, between us and the other big okay. ones. And then there's another question around, um, do you perceive any disadvantages of being asset light? I mean, that's a discussion that could be flipped over in the other direction also. Um, and I'm sure you have an answer to it. I have a hypothesis, but let's let's see what you say. Um, well, there are definitely advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the disadvantages is that uh, you do not always have control over the capacity 
capacity that you might need, meaning that you might have to overspend um, or make uh, uh, find compromises. Um, the advantage, and this is why we prefer to remain also asset lighted, that it allows us to be much more flexible, especially when it comes to scaling. Uh, we've grown over three x, almost four x this year. Um, if you would have bought trucks and hired drivers, we would have had a lot of capex and a lot of pain in managing and hiring drivers and keeping processes. It probably would have been the most complex part um, at the level of efficiency to manage such a big fleet that would have been more, almost been possible. One thing I want to add quickly, what we do is that we, uh, while not having the assets, we take uh, uh, over the full commercial responsibility for trucks for longer period of time. So we go to the small trucking company, say for an entire month, two or three months, we pay a fixed amount of money or a fixed plus a variable on the kilometer you drive. We take full commercial risk. So it's we can, let's say, dispatch and plan the trucks as we need them. It's sometimes our firefighting fleet that we use to intervene when we need to make things happen. And uh, uh, so in that, with that model, we have a lot of the advantages of owning an own fleet, but still keeping the flexibility um, um, to scale faster. Okay. So the, the the last comment here also is is pretty good related to my last question. Um, the, the question here is: um, Are you only working on road, or do you also plan to go to the sea? So, and my last question would have been: What's your vision for the future of Zender in the next twelve to twenty four months? So maybe you can tackle both. Uh, yes, absolutely. So. Our hypothesis is that for air and sea freight, we're going to see global champions. We have Porto in Europe, Flexport across the world, because bringing a container from China to Europe or from China to the US has a similar level of complexity. When it comes to road freight, uh, I think we're going to see continental champions. I know that this doesn't sound too intuitive because on all continent, everyone is trying to bring demand and supply together. But if you look at how the industries are structured across uh, the world, there are a lot of differences. In the US, you have a lot of owner operators that are entrepreneurs, owners of their truck that use a smartphone to get the next load. In Europe, we have more, the majority are employees meaning that there's a dispatcher, a boss on top that takes the decision. And this is why you need a complete different solution and process for Europe. And it's also why um, um, uh, Uber Freight um, did not succeed with their app-based model that works really well in the US, but did not work well here in Europe. So to answer, we're going to keep focusing on road freight. We could keep focusing uh, on what we do well today. Of course, expanding, expanding both geographically. Um, uh, we need local presence to address the different cultures, re uh, regulatory differences, uh, but also expand potentially in other segments that are not full truck load, less than truck load, uh, potentially more on the full, um, spot side of, 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 of transports. We're now very much focused on the regular uh, transport. So there's still a lot of opportunity. I want to conclude with one number. Road freight in Europe is 350 billion in size. It's twice as big as sea and air freight combined, twice as big. So there's a lot of space for us to grow. And as mentioned, it's highly fragmented with the top five players just having over 5%. So the uh, continental champion for road freight, that would be to the headline. I like that headline. I would, so yeah. I would sign, I would sign I'm, that. I'm looking forward. Forward to, to joining you on that journey. Thank you very much for being here today. You've been on the other session also um, for M&A based growth. Um, it has been a pleasure, and um, I'm looking really forward to you know the ride coming years. Thank you, Dave. We're just at the beginning. Thank Bye. you, Ben.